know, but you know, we've had time. Uh, the uh, federal state legislative working group uh, actually started in 2019. Uh, so we, we've had a, a quite a bit of time to study and, and prepare ourselves for uh, NIL implementation and schools right now, conferences and everyone is more about educating. And some, some schools have assigned third parties to come in and, and assist their student athletes from an education point of view and preparation point of view. And some have developed their own internal method for uh, educating. Uh, we at Ohio State have, have at this point decided to go internal. Uh, we're primarily educating our coaches, our staff, and, and our athletes on what it might look like. Uh, until it's passed, we're not really sure. Uh, we know enough uh, to educate, and so we've started that process and, and uh, just preparing for whenever it gets uh, approved. So without knowing exactly what will be approved, um, among those proposed models that have been uh, now talked around for about a year, is there one that you feel best fits uh, Division I uh, or specifically the Power Five conferences? Yeah, I'm, you know, I think I was chosen or asked to uh, co-chair the original working group in this space because I've always been a proponent that student athletes should be able to monetize their brand, their, their name, image, and likeness in some form or fashion. Uh, so I was glad I had the opportunity. And, and uh, I believe that uh, the endor being able to do endorsements, uh, being able to do lessons for fees, uh, and being able to actually monetize any talent and skill, uh, a business, so to speak, uh, that you have uh, should be allowed. Uh, there's a, we had at Ohio State, for example, a cross player who was a musician, and he realized in the ninth grade that he had a particular talent. And regardless of his across skills, he began to develop his musical talent, and he was selling his music on iTunes before we started recruiting him. And, and so we had to get a waiver to allow him to continue to do that. And <clears throat> that exists across the country. And so to me, um, endorsements, fees for lessons, or if someone has a particular talent or skill that they can monetize, we should help them you know, understand how to do it and do it the right way. Uh, make sure they pay their taxes and, uh, and, uh, and try and uh, promote uh, that opportunity for them. Now, you, you mentioned an example from one of uh, uh, your student athletes from a non-revenue sport. Uh, do you see there being any difference in the type of opportunities? Uh, give, for example, the one uh, you just mentioned um, from a non-revenue uh, student athlete uh, versus those opportunities that might be available at a large institution with a large athletics program like Ohio State uh, for your student athletes in the revenue sports like football and basketball. Yeah, I think the, the main thing will not necessarily be about around revenue. It'll be around attention. So the I believe that the social media space, the, the e-commerce space, so to speak, will be the platform that's used the most. So if you're a, obviously, if you're a top football player or basketball player at a place like Ohio State, uh, you're going to probably do a lot better uh, if you're doing it the right way. Uh, however, I think a lot of our equivalency sport athletes, those student athletes who are partial scholarships, uh, I think they're going to be pretty creative. I think they're going to do some things. If I'm a talented golfer and, and uh, I have a lot of followers in the golf space and, and I could do feed for lessons uh, in the summertime, um, I think that, that student athlete is going to hit a home run. What most people don't pay attention to is equivalency sport athletes at most institutions leave with that, just like the other students. And so the reality is, I think that they're gonna find ways to mitigate that. How do I cover my debt before I leave? And so I, I think you're gonna find some things in baseball and wrestling and golf and tennis and swimming and so on, where those student athletes are gonna be pretty creative uh, to try and, and mitigate the debt that they will have when they leave. Absolutely. Um, now, as a, a former uh, athletics administrator myself, I realize there are wide ranges of <laughs> opinions uh, when it comes yeah. to, uh, you know, liberalization uh, of the NCAA rules, and it's taken a lot of time for some of these rules to change. Uh, so I do have to ask, uh, it sounds like you're pretty open uh, to for student athletes to be able to do it whatever they want. However, might there or should there be any restrictions that are put in place 
on these name, image, and likeness uh, rights? Yeah, I think we, we need more protections. I wouldn't necessarily call them restrictions. <clears throat> I think we have to protect the student athletes from the uh, unscrupulous characters. I mean, they, they uh, will be taken advantage of. They're, they're, they're not at a point when they're 17, 18, 19 years old uh, where they really get it and someone could take advantage of them. And so how do we make sure we protect them? So having in place, uh, not in a necessarily approval process, but uh, a place where they could go and vet the deal. Um, and so one of the pieces of legislation is to allow institutions to, uh, to be able to help a student athlete vet a deal, not tell her or him that to go do it or set it up for them, but you know, if a student athlete comes to me and they have this agreement and it has look, 10 appearances during the academic year and uh, this company wants to use their social media platform for special promotions or you know, whatever, I'm gonna question the student athlete on if they got time, I'm just start with that. And so I, I think putting in protection so they're not taking advantage of the same thing with boosters, making sure that boosters aren't buying athletes you know, if I'm writing a book, making sure that, you know, a booster doesn't buy a thousand books from me, you know, so those type of deals or, you know, I think that's where we got to help uh, the student athlete and then also make sure that institutions or coaches aren't uh, using undue influence in this space to get a student athletes to make a commitment. Absolutely. Uh, and one of the external, I guess, uh, parameters uh, that, that the colleges and universities have to consider is the role that the federal and state governments will play um, because they've been very either progressive, vocal, or active even uh, with some states uh, passing legislation uh, to, to try to quicken the pace with which these NLI changes come through. Uh, do you have any opinion on what role, if any, uh, the federal and state government should play in this process? Yeah, I think we're going to need help from the federal government. You know, if we don't have a a piece of legislation that uh, brings consistency throughout the country on uh, how this is applied, uh, then we're not going to be able to operate uh, as a, an association. If every state has its own uh, laws relative to NIL, uh, then you won't be able to have a, a competitive uh, environment where you have some type of level playing field. And uh, you look at Florida, for example, right now, they have a piece of legislation, I believe it's effective July 1. Um, if we don't have in place uh, NIL legislation, then ultimately some federal uh, legislation, those schools in that state, um, they have to adhere to the law. They can't prohibit the activity. So I think we're, we're at a crossroads. Uh, and at some point, we're gonna need consistency across the country for all of us to be able to compete on at least some normal uh, level playing field. Absolutely. Um, and you mentioned uh, at the beginning of the interview that Ohio State plans to handle a lot of these processes internally. So I'll finish with a couple of questions to that point. Um, who on campus uh, you mentioned uh, you can certainly be a mentor and advisor uh, for some of these roles, uh, but is there anybody else on campus or within your staff uh, that you think um, is going to be responsible for administrating a lot of either the paperwork, um, the mentorship, or the guidance around uh, student athletes utilizing their NIL rights? Yeah, so we have two entities in the department that will have uh, education responsibility. Uh, and then we call them conduits to other organizations. So one is our, our compliance office. Uh, they'll have responsibility for education around the rules and regulations and the do's and don'ts. And then we have our leadership institute uh, where student athletes uh, who will ultimately have an opportunity to maybe get a deal vetted. Um, now we're also looking at and considering uh, some local organizations that we may partner with. Uh, that may help us. Uh, we also may engage some faculty members from the College of Business or our commercialization uh, curriculum. So there's a couple of ways that we're looking at it internally. Now we haven't excluded uh, the, the thought process that we may hire a third party company like Teamworks or Open Doors or one of those companies to come in and, and do something further. But at this point in time, we, we feel like we have some companies locally uh, that we might be able to engage uh, in this space. Uh, we have a company called Rev One that uh, helps students 
uh, with startup companies. And, and that is, that's what they do. And so this is really that. And so it's uh, the student athlete has a startup company they're trying to uh, get going, then they could go to Rev One. And so we're working with uh, to see the uh, president, the CEO there, Tom Walker, to see if this makes sense for us. That's very, very interesting and in an area probably that doesn't get as much attention, but being able to not only uh, sell the market yourself as an athlete, but start your own business uh, is something I, I think hopefully we all can agree uh, is beneficial and, and should be permissible. Uh, and I was on the working group. We, uh, we met, uh, we didn't know what influencers were. <laughs> so we, one of our first hearings, and I'll never forget it, it was in the fall of 2019, we had a panel of influencers. And one of them happened to be a wrestler from Columbia University. And he was a poet. And I forgot how many followers he had, something like 750,000, and he was on his way to a million. And he took time off, actually went to LA to, to learn about how he could continue to grow uh, what he had created. And, and he became a, an influencer in the poetry space. Now he went back to Columbia to finish his degree and, and finish out his other ability in wrestling. Uh, but that's a business, and and, and uh, so I was kind of proud of him, didn't know him, but I was really proud that he had that opportunity to take a talent and skill, because he loved poetry, to take a talent and skill and be able to monetize it, and who knows what he's doing now, he might be writing poetry books. <laughs> that, 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 that's incredible, that's awesome. Um, that, it, Last question to that uh, that very point then there. Um, Ohio State certainly, it sounds like, um, has some prospects in, in utilizing third parties where they're necessary. Uh, do you think that'll be the trend across the other institutions in Division I, uh, not necessarily passing the buck on NLI or NIL administration, uh, but utilizing third parties uh, institution by institution in order to uh, provide more opportunities for student athletes? Yeah, I think it will be. I think you're going to have third party engagement uh, uh, broadly across Division One because uh, there's little, there's companies that are starting to be formed. There's companies that are expanding their capabilities like Open Doors or Teamworks or others uh, to be able to do this. And so instead of adding staff or putting more burden on your current staff, uh, it's probably better to hire a third party to come in and pick up this responsibility. And they're much more knowledgeable uh, in this space. So I think you're going to see that be uh, pretty prevalent uh, in Division One, And, and uh, there'll be schools that uh, will try and do it like we're doing it. Um, and so we'll just see how it goes. Absolutely. Uh, well, I appreciate your time, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, joining us and answering the questions and, and being so open uh, with your processes and thoughts about uh, the anticipated changes. Uh, is there anything else uh, you think maybe we missed or, or, or anything uh, regarding NIL or, or college athletics uh, that you think would be good to pay attention to in, in 2021 uh, besides the rule changes themselves? Well, I think uh, you hit it, Brandon. You know, NIL is probably the premier issue uh, but I also would tell student -athletes, students to uh, pay attention to the transfer legislation. Um, when you think about uh, the rules that are, are about to be dealt with, uh, transfers for sports that historically have not had a one-time transfer opportunity uh, will change things. Football, basketball, those programs will change. So I think that's another piece that people ought to pay attention to. So thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We de definitely appreciate it.